knows, we will actually be recording this. Hamilton? Yeah, over to thank you. you, Harris. I appreciate um, the opportunity. I'm Hamilton Perkins. I'm the founder of Hamilton Perkins Collection. We make award-winning bags and accessories from recycled materials. We use recycled plastic water bottles, pineapple leaf fiber, billboards, and a whole lot more. Uh, we've been in Forbes, Fast Company, The Washington Post. Uh, some of our past client projects include Hewlett Packard, uh, Dow Chemical, Nordstrom, TJ Maxx, Barnes and Noble Booksellers, Zappos, uh, Oracle, Salesforce. We most recently uh, were included in Ellen uh, DeGeneres' uh, subscription box called Be Kind. Um, and yes, I'm a Women Mary alum, got my MBA uh, a few years ago and uh, super glad to be here today. Awesome, Hamilton, really appreciate it. So for those of you who, who, who didn't know, Hamilton and I actually used to be neighbors when, I, when we lived in Virginia. And as Hamilton was getting uh, Hamilton Perkins collection <laughs> off the ground, I was one of his early fir first customers in, in Hamilton. I actually still have the, one, of, one of your initial like bags right here. So uh, really that. excited to, to have you on. I think first and foremost, I think what would be helpful for everybody is a little bit more about your background, because there was obviously life before you became a founder of a, of a company, you were doing a lot of other different things. So would love to get some, some context there, and then we can talk about how you kind of uncovered this problem. Yeah, sure. Thanks again. Um, my background, I came from retail. I always was a kid that loved retail. I loved sneakers and fashion and clothes. And, you know, I worked in the mall. I started on a sales floor and worked my way up to being a buyer eventually. And I kind of felt like I hadn't seen the whole economy. I kind of, you know, just only knew this one part of, um, you know, the whole world, basically. So um, took a job at a bank, worked in banking for about seven years worked in about eight out of 10 lines of business, um, you know, did everything I could do there. Um, that's when I came back and figured out I wanted to get my uh, MBA. I had a VP that did a, uh, you know, kind of a side by side with me one day. He said, you know, I just finished up over at the, at the flex program at uh, William and Mary, you should check it out. I'm, you know, <clears throat> at the time I'm on nights and weekends, I'm selling, uh, you know, shirts and totes. I'm making like, you know, craft, like more, it was more like a craft type of thing. It wasn't really formal. I wasn't like, um, you know, I, I didn't really have like the structure that, you know, we have today, but um, I had actually already been over to William and Mary at that point and had done a few shows um, just like randomly. So it, it's something about it made me, you know, think this was actually meant to be. So anyway, um, throughout my time, I was, you know, meeting with a lot of faculty and uh, a lot of my classmates and, you know, anyone really that would talk to me. Um, I got a lot of advice on supply chain and um, marketing and finance and kind of learning how to, you know, kind of structure things in uh, the early days. Um, I left my job in 2016. Um, we launched with Kickstarter. We had a $10,000 goal. We hit the goal in about six days. We ended up bouncing around and, um, you know, we shipped about $25,000 of products from that very first campaign. We did trunk shows at Bloomingdale's in New York and, you know, country clubs all over. And, you know, finally we, we took a trip to Haiti where we got, um, you know, just an incredible education on the artisan sector there and um, got to meet a, you know, a handful of our suppliers that we were already working with. <clears throat> Came back to the States really energized and started working on getting our products into retail. So, uh, our products are carried in a couple hundred retailers today, small independent stores, um, you know, a few specialty chains, you know, uh, came from that experience and, you know, wanted to open our own store so that we could kind of test the market from um, kind of the direct channel. You know, we were successful selling to other retailers and letting them handle the sales. And then we were suc successful kind of, you know, renting space or borrowing space when we could, but we hadn't really kind of owned our own space and controlled the environment, controlled the brand experience, the messaging. So we did that for about 15 months leading up to um, and through the, the pandemic here. And um, we decided we would kind of close that chapter. And, you know, along the way, we got connected with companies like Zappos.com, who took a chance on us and sent us some of their old uh, conference banners with their logos and you know, entrusted us with, you know, their brand to make bags for their, or for their executives and for uh, resale purposes, 
you know, and that just turned into more and more opportunities, lots of, you know, small, you know, Inc. 5000, you know, from Inc. 5000 fastest growing companies to nonprofits to, um, you know, working on projects at Coachella Music Festival, you know, we've, we've been fortunate to, um, you know, keep our, our brand kind of in the culture and at the same time, um, you know, help some of the largest companies in the world with being a creative outlet to turn their waste into something that consumers will love. And um, that's kind of where we are today. We're um, focusing on our e-commerce store, you know, building that up. Um, Instagram ads, Facebook ads, TikTok ads, email marketing, SEO, just, you know, standard playbook there. And then, you know, at the same time, challenging ourselves to, you know, find, you know, even bigger partnerships with, you uh, you know, Fortune 500 companies, um, venture back companies, private equity back companies that want, you know, more uh, out of their advertising budget and want to repurpose that into something that can be, um, you know, earn, they can earn sustainability um, uh, points, if you will, as a way to um, kind of complete their corporate social responsibility and complete their mission. Yeah, Hamilton, one of the things that I've always respected about you and your vision and your brand is that you are, you are addressing a problem through a very tangible and very hands-on solution that is actually, it's, it's really accessible, right? A lot of folks think about uh, sustainability and they may, maybe think about carbon offsets, right? For example, if you're a large enterprise, that's very accessible to you. It's a part of your, your corporate charter. You're getting pressure from your shareholders and you're going to go execute on that. You're actually doing something that enables small brands, individuals to actually change the way that they consume in a way that actually is meaningful for the overall environment. Thinking about that, right? So like, let's play it back a little bit. Undergrad at ODU, student <laughs> athlete, finance. I mean, if I remember correctly, you've got, you've got a handful of financial certifications. So like, you, you know how businesses operate. How did you come across the idea of basically taking recycled billboards and turning them into Bags. Yeah, so the that was like kind of a second um, step for us because what what happened, you know, my experience led me um, basically to consumer research in the beginning. You know, I felt like there was always like a lot of pressure on the designers to come up with all these great ideas, and you know, I, I went to tons of trade shows and talked to a lot of people in the early days and found, you know, most of the design you know, responsibility was like very, like very small group of people were making big decisions on like an entire direction or merchandising plan. And I kind of just looked back at it as, as a, you know, it, what if you kind of flipped that paradigm a little bit and you went to like the actual customer and asked them, you know, I, I don't know who told the story. I don't know if it was, gosh, it's just like a story, but like, you know, in fashion, there was always, you, you've got the buyers you've got the, the PR people. And then, um, you, you know, you, you didn't, you basically didn't have the customers there, you know, like that. And then that story always stuck with me. Like when, you know, I don't remember if a mentor told me that story and I'm just like, wow, that's so interesting that the customer, like the actual end customer isn't actually in the conversation. And I've always, you know, kind of been a huge fan of just like what Amazon was doing, Jeff Bezos, like how they are just so customer centric. And, you know, if you read the letters of shareholders, you'll get a real good view of, kind of how they think about putting the customer first. Everything's just so customer driven and these things go back to the 90s. So I always peeked at those. And anyway, I just made my like best chance effort that I could, you know, like I, I basically set up a focus group. Um, you know, my wife probably thought, thought I was crazy, you know, um, I had opened up, you know, our place at the time, you know, opened up, um, we had kind of like a club room down on the basement and opened that up so that people could come in and, you know, we interviewed them, got their feedback. What's the best thing you like about your current travel accessories? What's the worst thing? What would make it better? Um, what are you, what music do you listen to? What type of art do you enjoy? What's your education? What kind of job do you have? And just really trying to understand, you know, where was like the trend going? And basically we came up with two ideas. One idea was a backpack. The other idea was the duffel bag. And so at the time we were bootstrapped. We were really, we were still bootstrapped. We didn't have a lot of um, you know, resources. So we said, why don't we just, you know, combine both of these products into one. And we came up with the first bag we made is the earth bag premium. You know, so that was kind of like, you know, how we got the product. Now the materials were the secondary side of that because we had always, like I had kind of gained a ton of weight, you know, because I was just, I was working full-time. 
I was in the business school. I was, you know, commuting back and forth. Um, and I was just like, I was about 30, 40 pounds over my normal weight. And I just, one thing I figured out in my life is like, whenever I'm not healthy, water has always been, you know, something that's really like central to help me kind of get back to, um, you know, kind of where, where I need to be, you know, kind of, uh, and, and I, I just said, well, why don't I go ahead and just drink as much water as I can? And I, I'm drinking a ton of water bottles, like at the time, just drinking, drinking. And I'm like, man, like something happened one week. I'm like, I don't know. I'm just going to, I'm not even going to throw them out or recycle. I'm just going to just let them pile up and I'm, but I'm going to make it neat and just see what it looks like. And I had this big tower of water bottles just sitting in my, my apartment at the time. And I'm like, this is insane. Like what this is, I'm just one person, you know? And then I, I just, went on Google, started learning, hey, look, like last 10 years, we made more plastic than we did the previous hundred years. I'm working in finance. So I'm looking at, you know, all kinds of fancy reports from the smartest people in the world that are like, oh yeah, this is what's happening in, you know, this advertising industry too. Like take a look at this uh, growth because look at the sales. And again, I've always been very like primary research driven. So I, I started calling up companies and I'm like, Hey, what happens to your waste? What happens to your signs when you're done with them? And, you know, can I come and tour? Can I come and like actually walk your, you know, with your facility manager and your operations people? And, you know, you'd be surprised. Like people actually said yes. And long story short, I did a Google search. I found a t- like a ton of different like results, but then eventually I found a supplier who was already making fabric out of plastic water bottles. And they said, you know, you're going to be the smallest customer we ever had, but we'll take a chance on you. And they basically, they gave us a sample. And then from there, you know, the rest is history. We were able to get started. Then we still needed the second material, the billboards, because we didn't really have any formal partnerships. I was always kind of like, I don't know about partnerships. Like, I just want to, you know, I don't want to be dependent on like partnership to run our business. But long story short, the factory that we were working with, who, by the way, was it's a long, another story on how we found that factory, but it was a William and Mary connection that helped us get it. And uh, it turned out that all of the um, signs, like this factory had a sign, a billboard sign above their factory at the time. And they were always being thrown out and they were kind of like a, a nuisance. Like they would like block their door and all this stuff. And they, you know, and so I'm, I'm going back and forth with the guy, you know, that runs it. And he's like, you know, why don't we use this material for a reference, you know? And like, why don't we see like just what happens? And so we use it as a reference. It wasn't intended to be the actual product, but when we saw it, it just made so much sense. It made sense. Like when you saw it and you saw how cool it looked and how the structure was good, it was going to be easy to clean. The materials were going to be sustainable. Like the whole thing just made sense. And then that's how we kind of just started. So then from there, of course, we expanded, you know, we found other suppliers. We work in pineapple leaf fiber now. Um, that comes from the Philippines. You know, we find tons of um, just interesting things that our customers really send us from sailboat sales to old apparel, T-shirts, things that like people don't really, um, you know, have a need for anymore. They'll, you know, let us know, hey, we've got uh, like a, a pallet of this or a lot of something, um, fabric signs. And so that's how we, uh, that's kind of how we evolved and, and found uh, the p- materials that we use. Got it. Yeah, and and I and folks, I, I think it's it's important for you to know for for Hamilton's for Hamilton's bags, they are they're they're kind of a, a two form piece. You've got an inside that is actually the billboards that have been recycled, and so every bag that will ever be produced is entirely unique. No bag will, will ever be the same. So Hamilton, would, when you when you got this like this duffel kind of backpack thing out in the market, what was the feedback? How'd you go get the feedback? Like what, what was that process like? How did you know, yes, we are really onto something or, oh man, I got to pivot. Yeah. When we first started, you know, everything was all online. So we were really going off of reviews that we had received either through Kickstarter or um, Mm -hmm. at the time we did it, we actually did a, um, we did like a, like a showing at an art gallery. So we, we kind of rented out this art gallery where we hosted a ton of, um, you know, just potential buyers of the product really. And um, we were getting feedback from, uh, we did it all wrong. You know, like we had 
one product and we had it in a glass case so no one could actually even touch it so it was that because we were so scared that someone was going to try to you know take it and like buy it or something and we wouldn't have any samples at that point so we really didn't have a lot of feedback we were kind of like talking to customers though that was the important thing i think that really helped us you know and then you know five or six months later we showed up at bloomingdale's at 59th street and that was the first time that we sold a product once we had inventory and, you know, I'll just never forget, you know, these, um, you know, folks in the holiday shopping time just coming in from, you know, New Jersey and New York and Connecticut. And, you know, they're just like looking at us, like standing in the middle of uh, the Bloomingdale's like, you know, what are you guys selling? You know, what, what is this? You know, but once we got them to actually stop, they were like completely in, they were all in, you know, people were like, wow, this is so cool. You know, definitely want one for myself. I want one for my kid. And, you know, just kind of like building that up over time, you know, I think the, the feedback that we found in the beginning was um, pretty much people hadn't heard of the concept before, because at the time you got to think this is well before your Rothy's or, you know, some of these other brands that are DTC, you know, huge VC back, like you never really had, like, it wasn't really like as much PR and like money. Right. And this, um I think at the time, maybe there was a Cole Haan collection or, or two, like, mm -hmm. and, and I'm talking like pages and pages of like Google searches deep. So really, there wasn't like a precedent for it. Now, of course, you got Prada, you know, you know there's all types of brands, Ralph sure. Lauren, all types of companies that are doing um, something with this um, concept, which is great because then it helps us. And that's what we found. The more that you know, the, the rising tide rises all ships, you know, it's like the more people are kind of familiar with this idea. Right. That goes back to something else that I had to learn about just overall copywriting, you know, and overall marketing. Like for us, we're addressing a market that like has heard of our company or like what we do in our concept, but then there's some people that have never heard of it. So there's like a different messaging and like layers to communication that you have to kind of take. So it really helped us kind of refine our communication by just continuously talking to customers. And like I say, once we opened our actual store, um, that was like the tipping point because there were so many insights inside of our 4,000 square foot pop-up store that we operated. And we just learned so much because customers will come in, tell us, hey, look, like, this is awesome. Like I, I came in physically or I purchased before online because of these two or three things. We just kept like analyzing that and, you know, literally just like hands-on approaches, taking down numbers of people and like, you know, asking them for further feedback and figuring out, you know, what can we do to make the product better? And, you know, and that's kind of how we've been um, getting our feedback. And, and we're, we're really, um, we try to, you know, just stay personal as much as possible. So it's not uncommon for me to just pick up the phone and call customers and, you know, just randomly, if they leave their phone number, just say, hey, just want to check in, see how things are going. Um, or your order's a little bit delayed because we definitely are working hard, but, you know, this is happening in the supply chain. Something happened here with the materials or, you know, when we bring in stuff, because the pineapple leaf fiber, we make that stuff in New York and LA. Um, we have other factories in Asia that handle more of our bulk orders, more of our more like mm -hmm. mass products. But when it comes in, sometimes like random things happen, like our pineapple, like we had like I've had two whole orders, like completely just gone, like UPS just completely lost it. Another one I've had a factory, just literally the material is just gone. So, you know, just having to explain that stuff. And, you know, I guess that's also kind of this weird thing in like business that I've seen is like the sorry or the apology is like the thing that like people remember even more. And that is kind of the crazy thing. You know, it's like. So companies are like manufacturing these like events to apologize for, but like we're actually having them. And it's just an interesting way of like how things work in the world. So Hamilton, you, you, you brought up a couple of things there about like your habitual way of going out and getting the tribal feedback as quickly as possible. Like you're not above just calling a customer directly and getting that feedback. So that shows everybody that you're a hands-on leader, you're engaged. If I remember correctly, you had to learn a ton about supply chain, logistics, and basically how to be an operator. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of your, your journeys to like go, like driving up to Richmond to, to get material and, and what, what that experience was like and how that transformed, how you kind of see about your, your overall delivery to the end customer? For sure. You know, I think of it in phases, like <clears throat> before you launch, it's kind of like, you're planning, you're strategizing, but you don't really know what's going to happen until you actually take that first step once you take that first step now you've got like 
actual data point. So everything from setting up systems, like how do you handle communication with UPS? How do you handle communication with uh, FedEx, DHL, other carriers, um, third party logistics or people that are handling, um, you know, import, export, customs, all these things that are just like, you know, not necessarily our core competency, you know, understanding like, where do we, when do we outsource? When do we try to keep it in-house? What is the, um, you know, kind of like level of communication or like experience needed for these positions? So There's a lot of trial and error, you know, fortunately um, our designer that helps us uh, in that area, she, like, she actually kind of understood some of that stuff and kind of came from a family that was like understanding that. Um, our investors have been really uh, critical in giving us, you know, knowledge on that. We've got, you know, a handful of consumer, um, you know, guys and girls on our team that, you know, both basically come from that world and like can tell us like, this is the best that's, that's going to get. It's not going to get any better is, you know, you, you can push to this point, you know, or just, just understanding like where you can push. Like I didn't understand where you could push to on things, you know, and even with the pandemic, like everything's been really crazy because you know, all the costs are just from sea to air, of course, are just like over, like over days are like, yeah, we can't confirm until five days out. And we're like, what, like, why not? Um, but yeah, we just literally, you know, trial and error, um, you know, I re, uh, dusting off books like the goal. I don't know if you guys still read that one in the, you know, operations class, you know, um, you know, picking up uh, just like lean thinking. I mean, I, I came from finance, um, you know, Bank of America side of it. We, I did a Six Sigma summer, you know, where I immersed myself in Six Sigma um, kind of for no reason because I couldn't even find a project to work on because it was not really in vogue at the time, but um, I still had kind of the learning. So I ended up learning a ton um, that kind of still helps me think about things today and kind of think about waste and um, throughput and just, overall you know making it more efficient but uh, for the most part you know just like trial and error that's really the best way that we were able to overcome that yeah it, so now so obviously you you were able to, to figure out a lot of those things you were able to deploy your kind of your initial products that came out of your kickstarter program but now if, if anybody goes to your website it's much more than bags right it's a multitude of different bags, right? So you, you've gone a little bit deeper in one vertical, but you've also gone a little broader and kind of spread out your product offering. Can you tell us a little bit more about how and why that came to be? Like, how did you discover where you should go and, and why you felt like it was important to expand your portfolio in, in, in that direction? Yeah, our customers always have kind of helped us figure out where we should go next. Um, it just becomes overwhelming when you just, you're selling a few products and then they just start saying, okay, well, I, I'm buying a ton of t-shirts and, you know, I would love if you guys made t-shirts, you know, and then you just get like kind of not forced into it, but like, it just happens. Like orders come in, like, you know, we would do things where we would like run little surveys, you know, you use your little survey monkey, little things like that. Just try to figure out what are, what products are people likely to want from us. You can use data, website tells you searches people keep searching for um small compact backpacks or searching for um you know different travel accessories and then there's like part of the culture too is like just seeing what actually do people want to carry or like being at um events and understanding like well it would be cool to be hands-free at coachella you know or like um getting uh you know before we worked on a project that was an experiential project for uh, a project at Coachella, you know, I want to say one to two years prior to that, we had gotten connected to, uh, you know, a celebrity, um, you know, celebrity party planner, you know, like top, you know, top celebrity party planner in, in the country. And she had ordered um, a handful of our products to give to her clients at Coachella prior to us ever doing anything. So, it was also just taking like little insights like that and just seeing like people that have like a crazy vision, like direction, they're in the, they're in the know, you know, people look to them for as an authority or as an influencer and seeing like, what are they actually doing? And then kind of seeing how can we be more of service to them? How can we bring more value? You know, it's kind of like that. It's like that old, you know, saying, of course, like just trying to find ways to be more valuable at, at a better cost. And then that kind of, you know, then, then 
layering on everything else like logistics and design and sales and all that. So, so Hamilton, you, you talked a lot about like getting close to your customer, understanding your customer, taking in feedback and really internalizing and actually taking action on that. There are plenty of folks on the call today that are at varying stages of kind of exploring their own thoughts and ideas about how to kind of go out and tackle some major problem in society. If you had to give them one starting point that they could then turn into a habit, what would you tell them to do on a regular basis in order to kind of conceptualize what they need to kind of get on the path to go do? <laughs> you took that in an interesting direction because I was thinking, where would you start just like in general, but the habit part, I got to think about that one a little bit. Um, I started with a personal problem. That's how I got going with what we do. The habit part of it, you know, I think up to 50% of the habits that we like up to 50% of what we do, some researchers say is actually habit. So you don't even think about it. You just, it's how you would go, you know, like I, I would drive like 45 minutes to the campus uh, and I, I wouldn't even really know. I didn't, I, I couldn't remember green lights or red lights or anything, you know, like it's like, a, it's like you're on autopilot. So um, I, I would say, I think number one, the way that I found to like set good habits was like stepping back and like being more mindful, mm. which for me, that turned into me meditating personally. So I like, I, I downloaded the Calm app, you know, Calm app gave me, um, you know, uh, just 10 minutes a day, I think I started with now, I think I'm up to, I probably do close to 30 a day, something wow. like that. You know, I do, I do two, one in the morning, one at night. Wow. Um, but what it does is it calms you down as a habit and it just makes you focus on breathing, which is, it's kind of hard to tie that to like, you know, some deadline that we're facing or like hiring or something, but mm -hmm. like it gives you the chance to really, focus on what's important and, and really kind of scale back and not worry about all the like flashy things that could like you could spend time on. And then I'd say that one habit probably that's the one that's probably taken me like from just kind of being in, you know, like a rat race almost of like just sure. trying to do so many different things, wearing a bunch of hats and just, but really just taking a step back, breathing and just saying, Oh, well, um, you know, I can, I can do more. There's a book that I read last year It's probably my favorite book of the last year of 2020 was, um, the, uh, not the power of habit, atomic habits, atomic yes. habits, um, by James clear. That was, mm -hmm. that's my, one of my favorite books on habits. Um, you can also check out power of habit. I think is Charles Duhigg. That one's really awesome. Um, and I'm sure I'm leaving out some other habit ones, but, you know, that's the other like thing too, is just like, if you, you could probably read on a lot of these different topics too, you know, and there's people that have figured out so much in a category where you can just learn from them. Or even if you take one or two things, I just try to take one thing. You know, I, I can't, I don't think I can take everything I learned in a 400 page book, but even if I can take one thing, sure, um, that's kind of how I look at um, kind of getting started and developing a habit. Yeah. So, so sticking on the the getting started theme, right? So you were kind of entering a market that it was a little it was it was a little early. Your idea was new, fashionable, and exciting, but you brought up the point that I mean, you had folks like like Bird, right? It, big venture backed companies that had well established kind of like runways, and they had a very clear objective of how they were going to um, to address sustainability and fashion, kind of all in the same way. You talked a little bit about how you were you were not really excited about partnerships. And I know that there are a lot of folks on this call that are just thinking about like, who do I talk to? How do I get started? I think I've kind of identified a theme. When you think about um, going after a market that is somewhat dominated by large entities, venture backed that have endless merchandising and, and advertising budgets, how did you carve out your niche and how did you become successful in your own way? Yeah, you know, I think um, for for us, what we did, you know, we didn't rush it. I think that was important. We had patience. It wasn't that we didn't have a vision for it. We just didn't want to have disproportionate, like, disadvantages and leverage in these conversations so that now we can be at the table with 
you know, insert like a major company and they, they, they say, oh, well, we look to you all as a leader in this niche, you know, in what you're doing. And we didn't just get there kind of by accident. It was like we took methodical approach, a, a methodical approach to building our brand, working on partnerships, doing what we could do with what we had. And then that leads to us getting more trust and kind of being in a position to succeed. So um, surprisingly or not, I mean, a lot of our partnerships have been, um, how do you call it, like inbound, you know, like a lot of them were inbound, you know, a lot of things people, you know, they reached out to us and just kind of, you know, it came from a conversation or it was a relationship, you know, relationships that over time have, you know, turned into something, you know, like maybe we reached out a year ago or even two years ago. And then finally we get a response back and we're like, oh, you know, you know, we didn't even know you were still thinking about us like that. Or, you know, so I think it's a healthy mix of both, you know, so now we're trying to be like more, um, I don't want to say selective, but we're being like really uh, intentional on like the types of companies that we partner with and like that we can actually get them the best result, right. you know, and that, um, you know, it's something that they really believe in and it's something that they really like actually want to do at the end of the day. Cause you know, we can't like make someone want to, you know, partner with us, of course. And I don't, I mean, I don't think you can with anything, you know, I think you have to, you know, that's the other thing I got from, um, there's a uh, book I read called breakthrough advertising, you know, mm -hmm. they say, um, you know, desire is not something that your product will create, but your job, uh, your product's job is to direct the desire of the prospect onto what you're, you're doing. It's already there. Right. You know, and that, that's like a kind of subtle shift in thinking um, that I think the more you can kind of like wrap your mind around it, and I'm still wrapping my mind around it. Um, it, it starts to pay off like in the long run. Well, that, that's not the system. That's not how the system is designed, right? If we think about it, and everybody on this call is a user of some form of social media, right? And it is now the attention economy. You've, you've navigated that in a pretty, like you, you've, you've made that work for you. How, how, have you. how have you used social to like, number one, draw interest, but I guess draw the right interest into a product that's already like really strong. Yeah, I mean, for social, you know, what we've done, because social is always changing, um, you know, we try to be where there's organic reach. Um, mm -hmm. We try to work with, excuse me, we try to work with um, influencers, micro influencers, content creators, micro content creators, you know, real people, our actual customers, you know, um, we, we've used you know, tools like user gems and, okay. um, you know, we've reached out directly to, you know, people to ask them like, Hey, would you be up for a partnership to, you know, create content with us? So it's, it's grassroots organic. Um, but also, you know, it's bringing the discipline of like direct response, um, marketing. So, you know, running ads, um, you know, doing PR, reaching out to bloggers, um, you know, and trying our best to kind of be in places where, you know, we can kind of show up where our customers are and it's not going to like be a fortune. So, you know, for now that, you know, the big drug is Facebook and Instagram, you know, that's really, you know, where a ton of traffic is coming mm -hmm. from. And, you know, there's contenders, you know, we're, we're starting now to kind of diversify out and start to, you know, think of ways that we can, you know, even appeal in e even to younger audiences because, our audiences that purchase are actually um, older, you know, and we haven't necessarily um, huh. developed as much with some of these younger segments, even though we have products designed for the younger segment. So that's another, you know, big opportunity for us um, when, when it comes to social, but for the most part, we're always testing, you know, we're always learning, you know, the rest of my day is like, tons of social, you know, meetings around, you know, what are we doing with um, our TikTok uh, ads? What are we doing with our TikTok creatives? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are we doing with, you know, we've got our Facebook agency uh, meeting. Uh, I think that's either today or Monday, um, you know, so reviewing numbers and figuring out, you know, how can we get better? You know, what are the opportunities? Um, you know, just trying our best to, you um, 
you, you know, be as valuable as we can on the platform. So that's kind of our approach to social. Just we want to bring as much value, you know, for our customers. You know, they're they're coming to us for inspiration. You know, they're coming to us for content. You know, they're coming to us uh, for escapism. You know, they're coming to us for sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, they're coming to us for uh, discovery. So, you know, some come or you know, some people are looking to just they're looking for a new brand that they can kind of just you know that they can love and like that can be there with them in this phase of their life, whatever that is, whether that's right. gifting their kid, you know, a backpack that's getting ready to, you know, show up on campus soon, or maybe it's like someone who's graduating, you know, or maybe it's, um, you know, a new phase in their life and they just need something that helps them stand out from, uh, you know, from a value standpoint, they want a brand that's like more aligned with their values personally. And, you know, we just try our best to, you know, create content that really reflects that and, you know, once they kind of come into our world and, you know, we'll try to let everything else from our, um, you know, emails, our SMS, all these other channels, like help, help right. kind of complete that story. Okay. Okay. So quick speed round, and then we're going to open it up for, for Q and A for, for everybody else. Uh, that's, that's, that's a join us favorite class and professor at William and Mary. And I think you may have joined. I was going to say the legendary Mr. Geary there, right there. I, I obviously, found, you know, accounting is so foundational uh, to what we do, you know. So, I, I mean, I really wasn't good with numbers, you know, and I still i am not the best. But, you know, I definitely will say that, like, from a foundation, um, there's nothing more about that discipline, you know, even just now that, like, you know, I have a bookkeeper and, like, you know, knowing what our accountants are actually um, telling us um and being able to make decisions with that data you know so that that's huge i mean i think um you have to have that so yeah shout out shout out to <laughs> professor gary there <laughs> awesome favorite restaurant in norfolk oh favorite restaurant in norfolk that's a that's a that's a uh that's a tough one uh, you know i we've really been like in a lot you know we haven't really gone out just because of everything right, maybe, maybe um, fav favor uber eats spot yeah. <laughs> yeah you know um no nah, I, I i mean there's always i think it's it depends on what you're going for like you're going for like you know experience you know i like I, i've always really liked todd jerks you know and, and um, okay wow yeah, yeah I, I think they've got really cool selection and just like atmosphere you know it's kind of a local spot um i also Trying to think, <clears throat> food wise, you know, I, I'm I'm eating healthy, man. I, I mean, I, I've That's been. That's good. Uh, I, I got a. Uh, I told you, like, I gained a bunch of weight and all this. So I actually I had tested uh, not having any meat, uh, any dairy. What else? No sugar for about. I think it was it was about 15 months. Also, it, it, it kind of overlapped with our store being open. Sure. So. I was really and, limited. And, and you obviously survived, which was amazing. Oh yeah, no, it was it was fine. I I did I did really well. I, I actually I expanded my palate a lot. Like I ate a lot more like different variety of foods. I kind of you know I don't know if anyone else is like this, but like I just stuck to like a certain amount of you know the certain same certain foods I used to eat. Um, but when you know I'm trying different um, vegetables or whatever beans, whatever, like it just it it, it opened me up a lot. Um, so yeah, it's kind of sure. not really a, like an answer, but <laughs> we, we do a lot. Of milk. It, it was good. It was good. So, um, Diane, could, could we, could we open it up maybe to, maybe to the, the folks and just see if there were questions for Hamilton? Absolutely. You can use chat if you feel more comfortable asking a question or, um, feel free to unmute and ask questions. <laughs> Hamilton, while, while folks are, are gathering the courage to, to chirp in, um, what is your favorite product in your lineup and why? Not that you want to pick favorite. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's it's tough because, you know, I I test everything personally because even, even our women's products, like I still need to like make sure that, you know, like, what does it feel like? What is, how is it responding? How do we, you know, correct it? You know, so I just, I kind of nerd out on, just uh the process and just design 
you know, I was on WhatsApp just before this with our designer and we're talking about some improvements to our totes, like some things that we're doing mm-hmm. there. And, you know, I, I just think that it's like adapting, you know, like you'll get, we, we're always trying to make something better. So even like the first versions, like for example, the premium that you have there, like we've, we've made it, you know, better in ways like we've, we've optimized it, you know, we've tried to, you know, add more strength to it, or we've tried to um, add more pockets in certain areas and, and, you know, padding, just different things that, you know, will make it more functional and, and bring more use. So I really just love the process. You know, I think, now also I'm nerding out on materials too, because now that we kind of have like a, a little bit of a name in our space, like, you know, we started to get like random like suppliers that reach out and just ask us like questions about, oh, well, have you thought about like, you know, this spider silk before? Have you, you know, heard of this, um, you know, this music cloth, you know, like, I mean, it's all kind of like, there's all kinds of different materials, you know, so we're just like scratching the surface. We're just getting started when it comes to just like different combinations um, of the products that we actually um, have already designed. That's great. That's great. Diane, anything, anything from the crowd? Not yet, but I am hoping if you, if anyone does have a question, please use chat or you can also unmute and ask your question. Hamilton, I did want to know if you, in retrospect, if, if there's anything that you would do differently or any piece of advice you can give anyone um, from lessons that you've learned. Yeah, I always say I would have started earlier. You know, I think mm-hmm. like if I could have started earlier, it would have been a lot, e- not easier, but like it, it just would have been a better um, time in, in theory because the channel, like we don't change as people is what I've learned. Like I, and I do a bunch of research into, you know, I'll go back and I, I read stuff from like Claude Hopkins, you know, he was this like direct response advertiser who's, I think he's responsible for like the Pepsi Dent account, you know, and he was um, like, you know, as a copywriter, he was getting paid like a hundred thousand a week back then. This is in the early 1900s, which was crazy. That's like today, probably making a million a week off of just your words, just your words. And he created a habit of the customer to actually, um, you know, want to feel that tingle after they brush their teeth, you know, like the, 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 the fresh, the fresh taste, the aftertaste, like that wasn't like, like apparently toothpaste doesn't have to have that. That's just something that was like invented and he's kind of like responsible for that. And so when I think about like little stories like that, and like, I just read all that old stuff from like all that, that era, I find that a lot of you know, human psychology, we just haven't changed like in like a long time. So the platforms changed, you know, the communication changed, you know, like that's the only thing that's changing. The mail order stuff from back then is that's Facebook and Instagram now, and it's TikTok and Snapchat now, but it's the same concept and the people are the same. So the triggers are the same and the consumer psychology is the same. Um, And so I just, you know, and another to, to tag on to that, another really good book is uh, Influenced by uh, Dr. Robert Caldini. And his stuff is like, I want to say like 30, I think Influence came out like maybe the year I was born, 85 or something like that. And I think the way he describes it, he says it wasn't, it didn't take off beginning, you know, it took some years, but the stuff in there, I mean, and everyone says this thing is like great from Warren Buffett to like some of the top salespeople, you know, they, they just say this, this whole framework of thinking about influence and like how we buy things is just it's so on point but that is still relevant today it's super relevant so what that shows you is like at least my takeaway is you know if you could have like started earlier you know like and and just go earlier you you could have uh you could still apply that stuff so that's the only thing I would probably do differently is just I would have started at maybe after undergrad and then, you know, I would say just um, just general advice, you know, um, I mean, I, I think now is a good time. I think there's, it's always a good time. You know, it doesn't matter when, you know, before COVID, after COVID, you know, during COVID, there's always a good time for a good business that solves problems, brings value to the world. Um, you know, I think just you know, invest in yourself as much as you can, you know, invest in your education, you know, learn as much as you can, 
you know, soak, soak it all up, become a student. You know, I, I um, excuse me, when I started, I, I literally just, I mean, I, I, I must have went through, I mean, I would go through Google searches all the way to the end when they say you can't, you, there's no more material on this thing. And, and that was like relevant to my world. So I don't think you can ever stop learning. And, um, and, and then the, the last piece of advice is just like, don't stop learning once you're done with the program that you're in, you know, because I think that's like another thing that I see a lot. And, you know, I even kind of fell victim to it a, a bit myself. I'm like, okay, well, I'm, I'm done now. You know, I can, you know, go get whatever I'm going to get done now. And, but you should always like be looking to learn more, like always be, um, you know, picking up some, something new, you know, Harvard business um, case studies, you know, you can get them things for like seven, eight, what is it? Nine bucks. You know, you can read up on different topics or, um, you know, or just, or just books. You know, I'm a big fan of books and podcasts. You know, I'm always finding new podcasts. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's kind of what I got. Okay, thank you. We did have a question um, that came in. Um, has the decrease in the economy with people traveling less, has that affected your profit margins um, or how you even make your products? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Um, it, it didn't affect our profit margins. It, I mean, we're kind of like a, I think we're an edge case probably if you think about it because we we're selling travel, but we're also not selling travel. We're sell we, we kind of sell aspiration, you know, we sell inspiration, you know, we sell, um, you know, we sell kind of like, like a, like a value almost, you know, like we're, we're not necessarily, you know, we're, I'm not saying that it's like not elastic or inelastic. I'm just saying we have done well because we were doing a lot of things wrong, <laughs> you know, we were doing a lot of things wrong and we just started doing them right. Um, and when you're small, there's, there's really not, you know, th there's nowhere to go, but up, you know, in theory, uh, I mean, we, we sell well into the six figures, but you know, we're, we're not like some eight figure brand, nine figure brand at this point. So I feel like a lot of those macro trends, they, they do help us. Um, but then we kind of like, we're covered because we're, we're just, we're just getting started. Um, if anything, you know, like it might've brought us even more exposure and more awareness because there are still, you know, companies reaching out or, you know, you know, even consumers and stores, you know, still ordering from us all along because they wanted to, you know, they, they wanted something that we had for their store or employees, or, you know, they still have people that are graduating for, from college or still, um, you know, there's still like a need for like going on a picnic or going to the beach and having something to like put your stuff in, you, you know, so like that stuff still, um, you know, our product is still really relevant in those scenarios and people are still going on road trips. People are, you know, still going on, uh, going to Airbnbs and VRBOs and they need something cool for the gram. So like, you know, our, our stuff is still pretty much relevant in that um, field. Awesome. Professor Gary, I think you had, you had a question as well. Yeah, I, I was going to ask Hamilton if I remembered correctly that you started out with uh, an emphasis on high end um, and premium materials, and I didn't um, realize at that time that you were uh, focusing on environmental uh, dimensions of the product. Um, so, is that am I right to think that you shifted substantially? the whole uh, focus of uh, your endeavor? Uh, yes, Professor. And uh, we started with leather goods, high-end leather goods. And you know, I appreciate that cost breakdown that we did on one of our portfolio cases um, during the program. That really, um, that really helped me a ton building our models. And yes, we, we ended up pivoting kind of our approach. We decided that from our customer research, our customers were still willing to purchase from us if we could lower the price and still bring them something unique and something different, because that's why our customers were buying the products that we had at the time, those kind of like high-end leather bags. They were made from auction leather or leather scrap from big runs because, you know, these big brands, when they do production, they, they waste more product, raw material than what we would, you know, spend for like our, our biggest orders. So we would, we would get that stuff at closeout 
and rework it into these fine leather goods. And those customers that ordered that product, that was like one of our early test beds because we asked them to pre-order, you know, this new recycled material product that was going to be better for the environment. It was going to be even more unique because we would open it up beyond just leather. It would be, um, you know, fabric, it would be billboards, it could be curtains, it could be, you know, theater backdrops, it could be anything. And, you know, that idea sort of resonated with that audience. So, you know, we just looked at it as, you know, maybe this is, maybe we have a, a, a fractal, you know, pattern going on here. Maybe if it works in this subset, maybe it'll work on a bigger scale. And, you know, we, we found out that, you know, customers still do like the high end from us. So that's why now we have a, we have a pineapple leaf fiber product that we offer that's um, anywhere from, you know, probably 50% more expensive than our canvas product. So it's, it's a high end product, but it's still eco friendly and kind of like reflecting the world that we want to live in that sort of thing. So our customers are very attracted to that comes in really, you know, dazzling colors and we've got, you know, silvers and golds and reds and all these, you know, combinations that we can make with uh, even the billboard. So that product's been, you know, really taken off really well. And, you know, I think even still there's a way for us to incorporate like vegan leather and what we do at a point in the future, you know, and kind of come full circle to kind of like where we, you know, kind of came from at a point. And, you know, I think for now, we're just trying to keep up with the demand that we have and just stay, you know, really just kind of stay within like what we do. Like we could sell, we could sell more, you know, like we would do more like things like we did more, we could, we could sell more, but it kind of comes down, I think, to patience too, because, we don't want to like sell so crazy that then like we don't have any cash in the bank, you know, and, and that's something we got to be uh, very mindful of because growth at all costs is, can, can be a, um, it, it, it can sound good, you know, and it's a nice story to tell, uh, you know, the ink magazine or something, but you know, you get, when you have suppliers and people to pay it, you know, that, that can be a challenge. Absolutely. Well, Hamilton, really appreciate your time today. And Diana, if there, if there are no other questions, we'll go ahead and kind of wrap it up. Okay, cool. Yep. Hamilton, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us, share your story, give a lot of perspective, share a lot of your tips and tricks about how you took a, a business idea that was just kind of this weekend project and actually made something of it. And I think you're actually really, really impacting in the world and making it a better place for everybody through a very like simple and tangible product. So again, I, I say thank you, but I, I, I've had the, the privilege of getting to watch you and connect, and connect with you over the past couple of years. I'm proud of everything that you're doing and I cannot wait to see where you take this next. Thanks for the time today. No, thank you, Harris. I appreciate that. I appreciate all the, all the love on social media, all the love and support you've uh, sent our way. And um, yeah, I really appreciate this opportunity and, yeah, feel free, anyone, if you have anything. I know sometimes thinking on the spot can, can be hard to come up with a question, but if you have anything, feel free to reach out. I'm, you know, real easy to find um, on social media or just email. Um, I would love to, you know, get to know uh, all of you and, and to, if I can be of any help, if you can learn from any of the mistakes uh, that I've made, you know, feel free to. I'm, I'm an open book. So thanks again. Diane? Thanks for setting this up. We'll see everybody. Thank you. Have a good rest of the day. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Bye-bye. Go tribe.